Well, you just heard it for yourselves. Several readings worth of commentary on the lives of the honest and the lives of the dishonest. It's uh, not an uncommon theme in the whole of the scriptures. We heard in the first reading, the prophet Amos sort of laments this, speaking for the voice of God, and he is one of very many of the prophets who come back to this sort of theme about the fact that God sees all things and that God laments uh, when we choose to dishonor ourselves and dishonor each other and, and, and reap destruction on ourselves. And the story, both in the first reading and in the gospel, is uh, threaded together in sort of the function of deceit in general and of lies in, dis- in, in general. Jesus gives this story as a warning. Now, the gospel begins by saying he says this story to his disciples. But if we we go back a chapter, we'll know that this is also a continuation of a longer conversation that actually began with scribes and Pharisees. We know that Jesus is ultimately giving this warning to them, and the gospel will say so. If you continue reading after this passage here, the commentary is, The scribes and the Pharisees heard Jesus say these things and they ridiculed him because they were lovers of money. And Jesus looked at them and he said, you make yourselves righteous in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. And so it's this reminder that nothing in the end is hidden. And this is what deceit does, or deceit at least attempts to do. It attempts to hide something. It attempts to prevent some sort of consequence or some sort of fear. Uh, from coming to us. And so the lesson then is um, as personal as your life and my life. It isn't just, after all, a fairy tale that Jesus gives. But it's important for us to pay attention to the contours of the parable so that we can be really convicted about how it works in our lives as well. We know the story pretty well. This is not a uh, relatively unknown. This is a fairly popular parable or one that we've heard a lot, right? And, and so in the story, pay attention to how this unfolds. The dishonest steward has been being deceitful for a while now, and now that he's being found out, it's clear that he's no longer going to be in the good graces of his master, right? He's, he's being fired, and there's nothing that he can do to be unfired. Now, for whatever reason, He has entered into this relationship, into this contract, into this bond with deceit. And the irony of deceit is always this, isn't it? Deceit, by definition, is a liar. Deceit, by definition, is a liar. And the first person it deceives is the liar. Deceit is always a liar, and the first person it deceives is the one who commits the lie. Because the lie makes a, a deceit makes us a kind of promise. It stands before us and it says, I know that you fear this thing that's in front of you. I know that you don't want some sort of consequence that you're about to receive. Just play this card. Put me in between the fear and you. And I'm powerful enough to keep it away from you. I'm powerful enough to keep the consequence away from you. And we're like, that sounds like a really good idea. I'd rather not face my fear. Or I'd rather not face the consequence. I'll just lie. And so we place the card, and maybe for a time, we get away with it, evidently in the same way that the steward gets away with it. Now, he has a particular problem at hand that he's trying to solve, which is evidently that he's been skiffing off the top. He's either been charging people their debts and stealing directly from the master, or he's been overcharging people and then cooking the books and taking the extra for himself so that it all looks square so that everything looks equal but one way or the other he wants money that's why he's stealing and what does he think that money is going to do make him rich and make him able to not have to need anything anymore that he can sort of have all the dreams that he ever wanted and his deceit has lied to him about this very proposition just take all this stuff and you'll be rich and nobody will be none the wiser, and you'll get away with it. But as deceit always does, it shows itself, it proves itself to be weak in the end and powerless in the end. 
to separate us from the consequence that we fear after all. And we do. We have to face it. And when he faces it, the, the sadness of it or the tragedy of it is that he ends up in the very opposite place that he was promised. And this is revealed to be true by his own conversation with himself because he says, well, I'm done. I have to face the music. And what am I going to do? Because I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. So he spent a long time in lying and deception to get wealthy. And when he's found out, is he wealthy? No, he's, he's actually left with nothing. And he says so himself. He says, well, I'm not going to go live on my spoils. That's not an option for him. His options are beg or do manual labor. So he thought he was going to get rich. The lie told him he was going to get rich, but the lie deceived him, and it was not powerful enough to make him rich, and it just left him in his poverty after all. And now he has to face it, because this is the nature of deceit. Deceit is a liar, and the first person it deceives is the liar. Notice how this isn't just a story about a steward and a parable, but... It's the very thing that was going on in the lives of the people Jesus was speaking to, the scribes and the Pharisees, but also all human beings. And how does it happen? How does it begin? What does it look like in our lives? What are the first things in life that we learn to lie about? How old we are? And our height and our weight, right? <laughs> we learn to deceive other people about those things. And then we grow up a little bit. And what's the next thing that we learn to lie about? We learn to lie about where we're going, who we're with, and what we're going to do, right? And then we get a little bit older, and we learn to lie about who we know and what we know. And we get a little bit older, and we learn to lie about our taxes, our private lives, all of the things out there that we think we can get away with because we won't have to render an account for it. Jesus says, these are like the small things, the small matters. And he phrases it in an unusual way. He says, here's the lesson about lying and about deceitfulness. He says, you have to make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth. I mean, isn't that kind of a strange phrase? I don't really understand that at first. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Why would you want to be friends with anything dishonest? But it, it's a sort of an idiomatic expression. We might, we might say it in a uh, more direct way like this. For I tell you, be in right relationship with those things that are easiest to lie about. Be in right relationship with those things that are easiest to be dishonest about. In other words, tell the truth. Live an honest life, especially with those things that, that are the easiest to be dishonest about, the so-called small stuff, the things in life that we think we can get away with because no one's gonna see and no one's gonna know, the things we don't ever have to tell anybody about because we're the only ones who know what happens on the papers that we fill out or with the choices that we make behind closed doors or where no one else is looking. Jesus says that's, that's where it begins. That's where we are most often deceived by a lie that says, I can shield you from the consequence. And Jesus says, usually how this plays out is that it gets to the point where we've done the small thing bad for so long we feel great that we haven't been caught, and sooner or later, it's not until the big bad thing happens that we realize we're in trouble. The reason that the dishonest steward did the small things deceitfully is because he didn't think it was of consequence. Until he found out, it was of consequence. <laughs> but now it's really bad. And it's not just that he's going to lose a little bit of money on the side, it's that he's going to lose his livelihood. And he's not just losing his livelihood, he has lost all of the wealth that he sought. It's like doubly bad. And this becomes for all of us in our, in our lives, in our families, in our communities, in our 
in our country and everything in between, it, it's, like a, uh, it's like a microcosm. It's like a model of how, it, of how things work. And it can be engineered in both ways. Because Jesus says as much that if the small things are done right, the big things will go well. But if the small things are chosen wrongly, sooner or later, the big things will go wrong. And so we simply look around for the evidence. Most of the time, what becomes visible to us are the big things, the stuff that's publicly knowable. All the people that he's cheated all these years are about to find out, if they haven't already, that he has been a cheater. Because they're about to find out that they're gonna deal with a new steward and that he's been dismissed from his job. And he's going to have to face the very people that he cheated. Oh, I wonder how that's going to go down. Is that going to go very well for him? But the, the large things, when they go bad, and we wonder, why has the large thing gone bad? Chances are high that it's because the small things have been going bad for a while behind closed doors. And if the big things... On the flip side, have gone right or are going right? Why does that happen? Chances are high. It's because the small things behind closed doors have been going right for a while now. But there is no communion between good and evil, Jesus sort of implies in this story. You plug in evil, eventually you're going to reap the evil. You plug in good, eventually you're going to reap the good. And so Jesus ends with his challenge. This is the challenge of the story. It's, it's a confrontation with you and with me. And he says, but, but you, what will you choose? Me, what will I choose? Because Jesus says it will go one way or it will go the other. But everybody faces the consequences of their choices sooner or later for good or for evil. Now, when Jesus has to um, challenge the scribes and the Pharisees, when he has to say uh, these sort of uncomfortable truths and, and direct people to the evil that's present in their lives, it's not because, obviously, he's willing and desirous to be mean and he doesn't want to smite people. St. Paul says this is why Jesus does all of the things that he does. This is the why the, the Christian message is the way that it is. It's so that everyone will be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. That's the purpose. Jesus says, don't live a life of deceit, especially in the small matters, because in the end you will be bankrupt and you'll be left with nothing. And I say this to you because in knowing the truth, I can save you and I can bring you to the gifts that are that are yours, I can give to you in the end what has been made for you. So we just, we hear these kinds of things play out in our lives and in our world. I mean, this, it's almost like we were listening to our, our moder just last weekend, this is like the story of what we heard last weekend, right? Father Chaz preached on the bishop's letter that was given to all the churches on this ballot initiative that's in front of us in our state, and that's an example in the here and now, of a really big thing gone wrong, a really bad thing, a really large consequence that we now have to face. And we ask ourselves, like, why do we even deal with this as a state, and why is this coming up, and what is with the battle of it all? And the reason that something like this happens, something really big and bad consequence that we have to face is because, well, in the a lot of the small things behind closed doors have been going wrong for a while now. Lots of decisions being made by people who have been deceived by their own lies. And to think that choices are of no consequence when in truth they are. All things are of consequence. And just as God spoke to the prophet Amos, God says, I remember those things. I know those things. And I will bring them to the surface sooner or later so that the account will be rendered. And then... Where will you fall? Will you fall with the bankrupt? Or will you and I fall with the righteous? And so if we shall fall with the righteous and make our lot with them 
and to live in that crowd amongst those people so that we may truly receive what God has destined for each of us, then it behooves each of us and all of us to know the truth and to live the truth for our salvation and for the salvation of the whole world.